Hello, I'm Stephen Sachs. I'm the artistic director of the Fountain Theater in Los Angeles. And welcome to today's online reading of the stage adaptation of Citizen, an American Lyric by Claudia Rankin. Every word is from her internationally acclaimed award-winning book. And this stage adaptation of Citizen was created and had its world premiere at the Fountain Theater five years ago in 2015. It was remounted by Center Theater Group at the Kirk Douglas Theater, and it was chosen by the Music Center to represent Los Angeles Theater at the Our LA Voices Arts Festival. And the play is now being performed at theaters across the country. Citizen is a stream of consciousness riff on everyday racism. And now in this moment of history, one of the first things we need to do in this country is listen, listen. So I thank you for joining us today. And I thank you for listening to Citizen, an American Lyric. When you are alone and too tired even to turn on any of your devices. You let yourself linger in a past stacked among your pillows. Usually you are nestled under blankets and the house is empty. Sometimes the moon is missing. And beyond the windows, the low gray ceiling seems approachable. Its dark light dims in degrees, depending on the density of clouds. And you fall back into that which gets reconstructed as metaphor. The root is often associative. You smell good. You are 12. <laughs> Ending St. Philip and James School on White Plains Road. You smell good. <laughs> and the girl sitting in the seat behind asks you to... Lean to the right during exams so I can copy what you have written. The girl is Catholic with waist-length brown hair. You can't remember her name. Mary? Catherine? Sister Evelyn never figures out your arrangement. Perhaps because you never turn around to copy Mary Catherine's answers. Sister Evelyn must think these two girls think a lot alike. Or she cares less about cheating and more about humiliation. Or she never actually saw you sitting there. You never really speak to the girl, Mary Catherine, except for the time she makes her request and later when she tells you. You smell good. And you have features more like a white person. Certain moments send adrenaline to the heart. Dry out the tongue. Clog the lungs. Like thunder, they drown you in sound. No, like lightning, they strike you across the larynx. I was at a loss for words. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you said this yourself? <laughs> Haven't you said this to a close friend who, early in your friendship, when distracted, would call you by the name of her black housekeeper? You assumed you two were the only black people in her life. Eventually she stopped doing this. So she never <laughs> acknowledged her slippage. And you never called her on it. Why not? Yet you don't forget. If this were a domestic tragedy. And it might well be. This would be your fatal flaw, your memory. Vessel of your feelings. Do you feel hurt because it's the all black people look the same moment? Or because you are being confused with another after being so close to this other? An unsettled feeling keeps the body front and center. The wrong words enter your day like a bad egg in your mouth and puke runs down your blouse. A dampness drawing your stomach in toward your rib cage. You look around, only you remain. Your own disgust at what you smell, what you feel, doesn't bring you to your feet, not right away. Because gathering energy has become its own task, needing its own argument. You are reminded of a conversation you had recently, comparing the merits of sentences constructed implicitly with... Yes, and... Rather than... Yes, but... You and your friend decided that... 
Yes, and attest it to a life with no turnoff, no alternative roots. You pull yourself to standing, and before you know it, the blouse is rinsed. It's another week. The blouse is beneath your sweater. Against your skin. And you smell good. Rain this morning pours from the gutters. Everywhere else, it is hidden in the trees. You need your glasses to single out what you know is there. You put on your glasses. The trees, their bark, their leaves, even the dead ones are more vibrant, wet. Yes, and it's raining. Each moment is like this before it can be known. Categorized as similar to another thing and dismissed. It has to be experienced. It has to be seen. What did he just say? Did she really just say that? Did I hear what I think I heard? That just come out of my mouth? His mouth? Your mouth? The moment stinks. Still, you want to stop looking at the trees. You want to walk out and stand among them. And as light as the rain seems, it still rains down on you. You're in the dark, in the car, watching the black tarred street being swallowed by speed. <laughs> My dean is making me hire a person of color when there are so many good writers out there. You think maybe this is an experiment and you are being tested? Or retroactively insulted. Or you have done something that communicates this is an okay conversation to be having. Why do you feel comfortable saying this to me? As usual, you drive straight through the moment. You wish a light would turn red or a police siren would go off so you could slam on the brakes, slam into the car ahead of you, fly forward so quickly both your faces would suddenly be exposed to the wind. You have a destination. It isn't like this moment hasn't happened before hasn't happened before. And the before isn't part of the now as the night darkens and time shortens between where we are and where we're going. You arrive in your driveway and turn off the car. You remain behind the wheel another 10 minutes. You fear the night is being locked in and coded on a cellular level and want time to function as a power wash. Sitting there staring at the closed garage door you're reminded that a friend once told you there exists the medical term. John Henryism. For people exposed to stresses stemming from racism, they achieve themselves to death trying to dodge the buildup of erasure. Sherman James, the researcher who came up with the term, claimed the physiological costs were high. You hope by sitting in silence you are bucking the trend. Because of your elite status from a year's worth of travel, you've already settled into your window seat on United Airlines when the girl and her father arrive at your row. <laughs> These are our seats. <laughs> I see. Um, I'll sit in the middle. A woman you do not know wants to join you for lunch. You are visiting her campus. In the cafe, you both order the Caesar, Caesar salad. salad. <laughs> <laughs> this overlap is not the beginning of anything because immediately she points out that my father, my grandfather, myself, and you all went to the same college. I wanted my son to go there too, but uh, because of affirmative action or minority, something or the other, I don't know, what are they calling it these days? My son was not accepted. Uh, you're not sure if you're meant to apologize for this failure of your alma mater's legacy program. Instead, you ask where he ended up. The prestigious school that she mentions does not seem to assuage her irritation. This exchange, in effect, ends your lunch. A friend argues that 
Americans battle between the historical self and the self-self. <laughs> By this, he means... Uh, you mostly interact as friends with mutual interest and for the most part, compatible personalities. However, sometimes your historical selves. Um, my white self and your black self or her white self and her black self arrive with the full positioning of their American positioning. Then you are standing face to face in seconds that wipe the affable smiles right from your mouths. What did you say? Instantaneously, your attachment seems fragile, tenuous, subject to any transgression of your historical self. And though your joined personal histories are supposed to save you from misunderstandings, they usually cause you to understand all too well what is meant. You and your friend go to see the film, The House We Live In. You ask another friend to pick up your child from school on your way home. Your neighbor tells you that she is standing at her window watching a menacing black guy casing both of your homes. The guy is walking back and forth and he seems to be talking to himself. He seems disturbed. Oh, my friend, whom you have met, is babysitting. No, 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 it's not him. I have met your friend, and this is not that nice young man. Anyway, I just want you to know, I have called the police. When you arrive home. The, the four police cars are gone. Your neighbor has apologized to your friend, and is now apologizing to you. The next time you want to talk on the phone, you should just go in the backyard. I can speak on the phone wherever I want. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Oh, ah, what's up, what's up? Ah. <laughs> My man. <laughs> Why do you care? He has just referred to the boisterous teenagers in Starbucks as niggers. Why do you care? Well, hey, I'm standing right here. They're just being kids. No need to get all KKK on them. Now there you go. There I go. Yes. Oh, there I go. And something about hearing yourself repeating this stranger's accusations in a voice usually reserved for your partner makes you smile. A man knocked over her son in the subway. You feel your own body wince. He's okay. But the son of a bitch kept walking. She grabbed the stranger's arm and told him to apologize. Look at the boy and apologize. You wanted to stop. You want the child pushed to the ground to be seen, to be helped to his feet, to be brushed off by the person that did not see him, has never seen him has perhaps never seen anyone who is not a reflection of himself. The beautiful thing is that a group of strangers of men began to stand behind me like a fleet of bodyguards, like newly found uncles and brothers. The new therapist specializes in trauma counseling. You've only ever spoken on the phone, her house has a side gate that leads to a back entrance she uses for patients. You walk down a path bordered on both sides with deer grass and rosemary to the gate, which turns out to be locked. At the front door, the bell is a small round disc you press firmly. <laughs> when the door opens, the woman standing there yells at the top of her lungs, Get away from my house! What are you doing in my yard? I have an appointment? You, you have an appointment? Oh, yes, 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 that's, that's right. I, I'm sorry. I, I am so, so, so sorry. Now, black people's anger is marketable. Black artists need to cultivate an angry nigger exterior by watching, among other things, you know, the Rodney King video. <laughs> now, uh, on the bridge between this sellable anger and the artist, 
resides at times an actual anger. Yeah, a young man in his video doesn't address this type of anger. The anger built up through experience and the quotidian struggles against dehumanization every brown or black person lives simply because of skin color. This other kind of anger in time can prevent rather than sponsor the production of anything except loneliness. Well, you begin to think maybe erroneously that this other kind of anger is really a type of knowledge. You know, the type that both clarifies and disappoints. It responds to insult and attempted erasure simply by asserting presence. Asserting presence. And the energy required to present. To react. To assert. Is accompanied by a visceral disappointment. That no amount of visibility will alter the ways in which one is perceived. Recognition of this lack might break you apart. Or recognition might illuminate the erasure, the attempted erasure triggers. In any case, Youngman doesn't speak to this kind of anger. Well, he doesn't say that witnessing the expression of this more ordinary and daily anger might make the witness believe that the person is insane. And insane is what you think one Sunday afternoon, drinking an Arnold Palmer, watching the 2009 Women's U.S. Open final, when brought to full attention by the suddenly explosive behavior of Serena Williams. Serena, in HD before your eyes, becomes overcome by a rage you recognize and have been taught to hold at a distance for your own good. Serena's behavior on this particular Sunday afternoon suggests that all the injustice she has played through all the years of her illustrious career flashes before her and she decides finally to respond to all of it. Oh my God, she's going crazy. What does a victorious or defeated black woman's body in a historically white space look like? I feel most colored when I am thrown against a sharp white background. This appropriated line from Zora Neale Hurston, stenciled on canvas by Glenn Ligon, seemed to be ad copy for some aspect of life for all black bodies. I feel most colored when I am thrown against a sharp white background. Serena and Venus, they win sometimes, they lose sometimes. They've been injured, happy, sad. Ignored, booed, cheered. And through it all, in evidence to all, were those people who are enraged that they are there at all. I feel most colored when I am thrown against a sharp white background. Graphite against a sharp white background. You attribute to Serena Williams a kind of resilient, appropriate only for those who exist in celluloid. Neither her father, nor mother, nor sister, nor Jehovah her God, nor Nike camp could shield her ultimately from people who felt her black body didn't belong on their court, in their world. From the start, many made it clear that Serena would have done better struggling to survive in a Malay painting rather than being on their tennis courts. Yeah, better to put all that strength to work in their fantasy of her working the land rather than be caught up in the turbulence of our ancient dramas. The most notorious of Serena's detractors takes the form of Mariana Alves, the distinguished tennis chair umpire who was uh, excused from officiating any more matches on the final day of the 2004 US Open after she made five bad calls in the semifinal matchup. Serena in her denim skirt, black sneaker boots and dark mascara began wagging her finger and saying, no, no, no as if by negating the moment she could propel us back into a legible world. Though no one was saying anything explicitly about Serena's black body, you are not the only viewer who thought it was getting in the way of all these sight lines. I feel most colored when I am thrown against a sharp white background. Yes, the body has memory. The physical carriage holds more than its weight. The body is the threshold across which each objectionable call passes into consciousness. I'm very angry and bitter right now. I felt cheated. Should I go on? I just feel robbed. And now 
Five years after Alves, here Serena is back at the U.S. Open again in a semifinal match, this time against Belgium's Kim Kleisters. Serena is not playing well and loses the first set. In response, she smashes her racket on the court. That's as angry as I've ever seen her. Oh, the umpire gives her a warning. Another violation will mean a point penalty. She's in the second set, the critical moment. Five, six in Kleister's favor, serving to stay in the match at match point. A line judge employed by the US Open to watch Serena's body, it's every move, says Serena stepped on the line while serving. What? Were you serious? She is she serious. Is serious. She has seen a foot fault no one else is able to locate. No foot fault? You definitely do not see a foot fault there. That's over officiating for certain. Oh, her foot fault call was way off. You don't make a call that can decide a match unless it's flagrant. You look at Kim Kleisters. You try to entertain the thought that this scenario could have played itself out the other way. And as Serena turns to the lines woman and says, I swear to God, I'm gonna take this fucking ball and shove it down your fucking throat. You hear that? I swear to God. As offensive as her outburst is, it is difficult not to <laughs> applaud her for reacting immediately to being thrown against a sharp white background. For fighting crazily against the so-called wrongness of her body's positioning at the service line. She says in 2009, the words that should have been said to the umpire in 2004, the words that would have acknowledged what was actually happening on the court. Now, Serena's reaction is read as insane, and her punishment for this moment, the point penalty resulting in the loss of the match. An $82,500 fine, plus a two-year probationary period by the Grand Slam Committee? Perhaps the committee's decision is only about context, though context is not meaning. It is a public event being watched in homes across the world. It is difficult not to think that if Serena lost context by abandoning all rules of civility, it could be because her body, trapped in a racial imaginary, trapped in disbelief, code for being Black in America, is being governed not by the tennis match she is participating in, but by a collapsed relationship that it promised to play by the rules. This is how racism feels no matter the context. The rules that everyone else gets to play by no longer apply to you. And to call this out by calling out, I swear to God, is to be called insane. Brass. Crazy. Bad sportsmanship. Two years later, Serena is playing in the US Open final. She is expected to win. Some speculate Serena especially wants to win this Grand Slam because it is the 10th anniversary of the attack on the Twin Towers. It is believed that by winning, she will become the, uh, uh, the oh gosh, she will become the red-blooded American participant that we all know and love. Think Arthur Ashe after his death. All the bad calls, the boos, the criticisms that she has made ugly the game of tennis. Through her looks, as well as her behavior. That entire cluster of betrayals will be wiped clean with this win. The umpire rules correctly that Serena, by shouting, Come on! Interfered with Stoser's concentration. A ball that Stoser seemingly would not have been able to return becomes Stoser's point. Are you trying to screw me again? Is this the same umpire? It isn't. Aren't you the one that screwed me over last time here? Serena's frustrations, her disappointments, exist within a system you understand not to try to understand. Because to do so is to understand the erasure of the self as ordinary. Yeah, you are. Don't look at me. For Serena, the daily diminishment is a low flame. Constant drip. Really? Don't even look at me. Every look, every comment, every bad call blossoms out of history through her onto you. Who would do such a thing? Don't look my way. 
to understand is to see Serena as hemmed in as any other black body thrown against our American background. I am not the one, don't look my way. But who can turn away? Serena is not running out of breath despite all her understanding. She continues to serve up aces while smashing rackets and fraying hems. In the 2012 Olympics, she brought home the only two gold medals the Americans would win in tennis. After her three-second celebratory dance on center court at the All England Club, the American media reported, There was Serena, crip-walking all over the most lily-white place in the world. Couldn't help but shake your head. What Serena did was akin to cracking a tasteless X-rated joke inside a church. What she did was immature and classless. Before making How to Be a Successful Black Artist, Hennessy Youngman uploaded How to Be a Successful Artist. While putting forward the argument that one needs to be white to be truly successful, he adds that this might not work for blacks because... If a nigga paints a flower, it becomes a slavery flower. Flower de Amistad and shit. Ah. Oh that any relationship between the white viewer and the black artist immediately becomes, becomes one between white persons and black property, which was the legal state of things once upon a time. Serena is interviewed after her 2012 Olympic victory. I was planning on calling your victory dance the Serena Shuffle. <laughs> However, I have learned from the American press that it is a crip walk, a gangster dance. Do I look like a gangster to you? Yes. Um, are you confident you can win your upcoming matches? At the end of the day, I'm very happy with me and I'm very happy with my results. Serena would go on to win every match she played between the U.S. Open and the 2012 Championship Tournament. She would do this without any reaction to a number of questionable calls. She has grown up. As if responding to racism is childish. She is developing the admirable calm and measured logic of an Arthur Ashe who was dignified and courageous in his ability to confront injustice without making a scene. Watching this newly contained Serena, you begin to wonder if she finally has given up wanting better from her peers. Or if she too has come across Hennessy's art thoughts and is channeling his assertion that the less that is communicated, the better. Be ambiguous. This could also be disassociation. Serena has had to split herself off from herself and create a different persona. Now there's no calling out. No yelling. No cursing. No finger wagging. Or head shaking. Then, two weeks after Serena is named Player of the Year, Caroline Wozniacki, a former number one player, imitates Serena. All in good fun. Racist? CNN wants to know if outrage is the proper response. Be ambiguous. Be white. In this real and unreal moment, we have Wozniacki's image of smiling blonde goodness, posing as the best female tennis player of all time. You are rushing to meet a friend in a distant neighborhood of Santa Monica. You are late, you nappy-headed hoe. What did you say? You have heard every word. This person has never referred to you like this in your presence, never code-switched in this manner. What did you say? She doesn't... Uh, Perhaps physically cannot. Repeat what she just said. Maybe the content of her statement is irrelevant and she only means to signal the stereotype of Black people time by employing what she perceives to be Black people language. 
or maybe she is jealous or whoever you were with. And wants to suggest you are nothing. Or everything. Her. Maybe she wants to have a belated conversation about Don Imus and the women's basketball team he insulted with this language. You don't know. You don't know what she means. You don't know what response she expects from you, nor do you care. For all your previous understandings, suddenly incoherence feels violent. You both experience this cut. 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 Which she keeps insisting is a joke. A joke stuck in her throat. And like any other injury, you watch it rupture along its suddenly exposed suture. <laughs> oh my God, when, when a woman you work with calls you by the name of another woman you work with, is it too much of a cliche not to laugh out loud with the friend beside you? Oh no, she didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Still, in the end, so what? Who cares? I mean, she had a 50-50 chance of getting it right. Yes. And in my email, her apology note appears. Our mistake. Apparently, your own invisibility is the real problem causing confusion. What did you say? Uh, excuse me. I was next. Oh, oh, my God. I, I didn't see you. You must be in a hurry. No, no, no. I, I really I just didn't see you. At the end of a brief phone conversation, you tell the manager you're speaking with that you will come by his office to sign the form. When you arrive. I didn't know you were black. Oh, um, I didn't mean to say that. Aloud. What? You didn't mean to say that aloud. And when the woman with the multiple degrees says, I didn't know black women could get cancer. You realize that nowhere is where you would get from here. A friend tells you. I saw a photograph of you on the internet. Why do you look so angry? Do you look angry? Well, you wouldn't have said so. I chose the photograph because it looked the most relaxed. Ah, oh, this unsmiling image of you makes him uncomfortable, and he needs you to account for that. If you were smiling, what would that tell him about your composure in his imagination? You wait at the bar of a restaurant for a friend. And a man wanting to make conversation, nursing something, takes out his phone to show you a picture of his wife. You say, oh. She's beautiful. She is. He says. Beautiful and black, like you. <sighs> Despite the fact that you have the same sabbatical schedule as everyone else, she says. You are always on sabbatical. <laughs> you are friends, so you respond. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> no, exactly. What do you mean? <laughs> Someone in the audience asks the man promoting his new book on humor, what makes something funny? Ah, uh, uh, context. All right. If someone said something, like about someone, and you were with your friends, <laughs> you would probably laugh. But if they said it out loud, where Black people could hear what was said, you might not, probably would not. Only then do you realize you are among the others and not friends. Not long ago, you're in a room where someone asked the philosopher, Judith Butler. What makes language hurtful? Uh, our very being exposes us to the address of another. We suffer from the condition of being addressable. Our emotional openness is carried by our addressability. Now language navigates this. For so long, you thought the ambition of racist language was to denigrate and erase you as a person. After considering Butler's remarks, you begin to see yourself as rendered hyper visible. Language that feels hurtful is intended to exploit all the ways that you are present. Your alertness. Your openness. 
Your desire to engage. Actually demand. Your presence. You're looking up. You're talking back. And as insane as it is. Saying please. Being around black people is like watching a foreign movie without translation. Uh, do you think your credit card will work? You didn't ask that of your friend who went before you. You want her to say something as witness and as a friend is not you, her silence says so. Because you are watching all of this take place even as you participate in it, you say nothing as well. Come over here with me, your eyes say. Why on earth would she? What is wrong with you? This question gets stuck in your dreams. You have to learn not to absorb the world. Sometimes I can hear my own voice saying silently to whomever, you are saying this thing and I am not going to accept it. I refuse to carry what doesn't belong to me. You take in things you don't want all the time. Some ordinary moment. All its intended targets. All the meanings come into focus. Hold up. Did you just hear? Did you just say? Did you just see? Did you just do that? Then the voice in your head silently tells you to take your foot off your throat. Because just getting along shouldn't be an ambition. Sometimes you sigh. The world says, stop that. Stop that. Forget all that. Headaches begin. You ask yourself, how can I help you? A glass of water. The coded tablets live in your purse next to your license. Feeling better? The watching tennis isn't a cure for feeling. It is a clean displacement of effort, will, and disappointment. The world is wrong. You can't put the past behind you. It is buried in you. It's, it has turned your flesh into its own cupboard. Not everything remembered is useful, but it all comes from the same, same world to be stored in you. Who did what to whom on which day? Who said that? She said what? What did he just do? Did she really just say that? Said what? What did she do? Did I hear what I think I heard? Did that just come out of my mouth? His mouth? Your mouth? Do you remember when you sighed? Memory is a tough place. You were there. If this is not the truth, it is also not a lie. Just the ball going back and forth. The problem is not one of a lack of memories. The problem is simply a lack. Feeling better? The ball isn't being returned. I wonder if Serena will be able to put this incident aside. The player trying to put her feelings behind her, dumping ball. After ball. After ball. Into the net. You can retire with an injury. You can't walk away because you feel bad. Feel good. Feel better. Move forward. Let it go. Come on. Come on. Come on. Too much, too much, too much. Move on. Let it go. Come on. Hurricane Katrina, aftermath, destruction, flooding, bodies. Hours later, still in the difficulty of what it is to be just like that inside it. Standing there. Maybe waiting. Maybe waving. <laughs> Standing where the deep waters of everything backed up. One said climbing over bodies. One said stranded on a roof. One said trapped in the building. In the difficulty. 
Nobody coming. Who could see it coming? The difficulty of that. Have you seen their faces? Faith, not fear. Where are they? Where was anyone? This is a goddamned emergency. A classic binary between the rich and the poor, between the haves and the have-nots, between the whites and the blacks. The difficulty of all that. Bima says it isn't, it isn't safe to be here. He gave me a flashlight. I didn't want to turn it on. I didn't want to shine a light on that. It's awful to go back home to find your own dead child. What I'm hearing, which is sort of scary, is they all want to stay here in Texas. They forgot about us. And so many of the people in the arena here, you know, were underprivileged anyway. So this is working very well for them. You simply get chills every time you see these poor individuals. So many of these people, almost all of them that we see are so poor and they are so black. Have you seen their faces? Oh my God. Unbelievable. Dehydration. Overheating. No electricity. No power. No way to communicate. We are drowning here. Still in the difficulty. You call out to them. I don't see them. Call out anyway. Did you see their faces? I don't know what the water wanted. It wanted to show you no one would come. If you would just oh. cry out to know what you'll sound like. Sometimes I is supposed to hold what is not there. Until it is. Then what is comes apart the closer you are to it. This makes the first person a symbol, barely holding the person together. I has so much power. It's insane. The first person can't pull you together. Shit, you are reading minds. Everyone understood you to be suffering. Still, everyone thought you thought you were the sun. Never mind our unlikeness. I can hear the noise in your voice. Why we survive and can look back is beyond me. It is not something to know. This ill-spirited hell on Main Street, nobody's here, broken down first person, could be one of many definitions of being to pass on. Calling out the past with a newly minted, fuck you. Well, maybe you don't agree. Yeah, maybe you don't think so. I was creating a life study of a monumental first person. Oh, if you need to feel that way. A Brahmin first person. Still, you are here, and here is nowhere. Sit down, pull together. Yours is a strange dream. No, a strange beach. Each body is a strange beach. And if you let in the excess emotion, you will recall the Atlantic Ocean breaking on our heads. On the train, the woman standing makes you understand that there are no seats available. And yet there is one. Is the woman getting off at the next stop? No, she'd rather stand all the way to Union Station. The space next to the man is a, a pause in the conversation you are suddenly rushing to fill. You step quickly over the woman's fear, a fear she has, she shares, you let her have it. The man doesn't acknowledge you as you sit down because the man knows more about the unoccupied seat than you do. For him, you imagine it is more like breath than wonder. He's had to think about it so much, you wouldn't call it thought. When another passenger leaves his seat and the standing woman sits, you glance over at the man. He's gazing out the window into what looks like darkness. You sit next to the man on the train. Bus. In the plane. Waiting room. Anywhere he could be forsaken. You put your body there in proximity to. 
adjacent to? Alongside. Within. You don't speak unless you're spoken to and your body speaks to the space you fill and you keep trying to fill it except the space belongs to the body of the man next to you, not to you. Where he goes, the space follows him. If the man left his seat before Union Station, you'd simply be another person in a seat on the train. You would cease to struggle against the unoccupied seat. When, where, why? Space won't lose its meaning. <laughs> you imagine if the man spoke to you, he would say, it's okay. I'm okay. You don't need to sit here. You don't need to sit and you sit and look at him, past him into the darkness the train is moving through, a tunnel. Darkness allows you to look at the man. Does he feel you looking at him? You suspect so. What does suspicion mean? What does suspicion do? The soft gray green of your cotton coat touches the sleeve of him, your shoulder to shoulder. The train moves too fast for your eyes to adjust to anything beyond the man, the window, the tiled tunnel, its slick darkness. Occasionally, a white light flickers by like a displaced sound. From across the aisle, tracks, room, harbor, world. A woman asks a man in the rows ahead if he would mind switching seats. She wishes to sit with her daughter or son. You hear, but you, you don't hear, you can't see. It's then that the man next to you turns to you. And as if from inside your own head, you agree that if anyone asks you to move, <laughs> you'll tell them, we are traveling as a family. Ole, 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 ole. Every day I think about where I came from, and I am still proud to be who I am. Big Algerian shit. Dirty terrorist. Nigger! There is no black who has not felt briefly or for long periods with anguish sharp or dull in varying degrees and to varying effect, simple, naked, and unanswerable hatred. Who has not wanted to smash any white face he may encounter in a day to break the bodies of all white people and bring them low, as low as the dust into which he himself has been and is being trampled. No black who has not had to make his own precarious adjustment. And yet the adjustment must be made rather it must be attempted. Do you think two minutes from the end of a World Cup final, two minutes from the end of my career, I wanted to do that? For all that he is, people will say he remains to us an Arab. Big Algerian shit. Dirty terrorist. When such things happen, he must grit his teeth. Walk away a few steps, elude the passerby who draws attention to him. Big Algerian shit. Dirty terrorist. Nigga. That man who is forced each day to snatch his manhood, his identity, out of the fire of human cruelty that rages to destroy it, knows something about himself and human life that no school on earth, and indeed no church can teach. He achieves his own authority. And that is unshakable. Because in order to save his life, he is forced to look beneath appearances, to take nothing for granted, to hear the meaning behind the words. The state of emergency is also always a 
state of emergence. What we have here is not the bringing to light of a character known and frequented a thousand times in the imagination or in stories. It is the white man who creates the black man, but it is the black man who creates. This thing was there. We grasped it in a living motion. What he said touched the deepest part of me. The rebuttal assumes an original form. This endless struggle to achieve and reveal and confirm a human identity, human authority, contains for all its horror, something very beautiful. My brothers are notorious. <laughs> they have not been to prison. They have been imprisoned. The prison is not a place you enter. It is no place. My brothers are notorious. They do regular things like wait. On my birthday, they say my name. The days of our childhood together, it looked like we rescued ourselves, were rescued. Then they are these days. Each day <laughs> of our adult lives, they will never forget our way through these brothers. These brothers. Each brother. Each, Each brother. brother. My brother. My brother. Dear brother. Dear brother. My dearest brothers, dear heart. Your hearts are broken. This is not a secret, though there are secrets. And as yet, I don't understand how my sorrow has turned into my brother's hearts. The hearts of my brothers are broken. If I knew another way to be, I would call up a brother. I would say, my brother, dear brother, my dearest brothers, dear heart. Those years of and before me and my brothers, the years of passage, plantation, migration, of Jim Crow, segregation, of poverty, inner cities, profiling, of one in three, two jobs, boy, hey boy, each a felony, accumulate into the hours inside our lives where we are all caught hanging. The rope inside us, the tree inside us, its roots, our limbs, a throat sliced through. And when we open our mouth to speak, blossoms, oh, blossoms, no place coming out. Brother, dear brother, that kind of blue. The sky is the silence of brothers all the days leading up to my call. If I called, I'd say goodbye before I broke the goodbye. I say goodbye before anyone can hang up. Don't hang up. My brother hangs up though he is there. I, I keep talking. The talk keeps him there. The sky is blue, kind of blue. The day is hot. Is it cold? Uh, are, you, are you cold? It does get cool. Is it cool? Are you cool? My brother is completed by sky. The sky is his silence. Eventually, he says, It is raining. It is raining down. It was raining. It stopped raining. It is raining down. He won't hang up. He's there. He's there, but he's hung up. 
goodbye, I say. I break the goodbye. I say goodbye before anyone can hang up. Don't, don't hang up. Don't hang up. Wait with me. Wait with me. Wait with me. Wait with, with me. me. Though the waiting might be the call of goodbyes. In the next frame, the pickup truck is in motion. Its motion activates its darkness. The pickup truck is a condition of darkness and motion. It, it makes a dark subject. You mean a black subject? No, no, a black object. Then the pickup truck is beating the black object to the ground. The tire marks the crushed organs. Then the audio. I ran that nigger over. Do you recognize yourself, Deadman? In the circulating photo you were looking down, were you dreaming of this day, all the days of your youth? In the daydream, did the pickup take you home? A pickup fueling the road to... I ran that nigger over. Baldwin says, skin color cannot be more important than the human being. Was the pickup constructing or exploding whiteness out of you? You are so sorry. You are angry. I ran that nigger over. James Craig Anderson is dead. You are so young, Deadman, were so young. James Craig Anderson is dead. I ran that nigger over. What else, you Deadman, what up? What's up is James Craig Anderson is dead. So sorry, so angry, imploding anger. It must let you go. It let you go. Knew whatever was in front of me was happening. And then the police vehicle came to a screeching halt in front of me, like they were setting up a blockade. Everywhere were flashes, a siren sounding, and a stretched out roar. Get on the ground! Get on the ground now! Then I just knew. And you are not the guy, and still you fit the description, because there's only one guy who is always the guy fitting the description. I left my client's house, knowing I would be pulled over. I knew. I just knew. I opened my briefcase on the passenger seat just so they could see. Yes, officer, rolled around on my tongue, which grew out of a bell that could never ring because its emergency was a tolling I was meant to swallow. You can't drive yourself sane. So angry, you are crying. You can't drive yourself sane. Then flashes, a siren, a roar, and you are not the guy, and still you fit the description, because there is only one guy who is always the guy fitting the description. Get on the ground! Get on the ground now! <laughs> I must have been speeding. No, you weren't speeding. I wasn't speeding? Then why are you pulling me over? Why am I pulled over? To put your hands where they can be seen! Put your hands in the air! To put your hands up! Then you are stretched out on the hood, then cuffed. Get on the ground now! Each time it begins in the same way. It doesn't begin the same way. Each time it begins, it's the same. Flashes, siren, a roar. Maybe because home was a hood the officer could not afford. <laughs> I was pulled out of my vehicle a block from my door, handcuffed and pushed into the police vehicle's back seat, the officer's knee pressing into my collarbone. Each time it begins in the same way. It doesn't begin the same way. Each time it begins, it's the same. Go ahead, hit me, motherfucker. You can't drive yourself sane. You are not insane. You are not the guy. This is what it looks like. You know this is wrong. This is not what it looks like. You need to be quiet. <laughs> this is wrong. You need to close your mouth now. This is what it looks like. And you are not the guy and still you fit the description because there is only one guy who is always the guy fitting the description. 
can't drive yourself sane. So angry, you can't drive yourself sane. Uh, the charge the officer decided on was exhibition of speed. After fingerprinting, I was told to stand naked. I stood naked. It was only then I was instructed to dress to leave, to walk all those miles back home. Still, you are not the guy. Still, Still you fit, you the, fit description. the description. Because there is only one Still, guy. Because there's only one who's guy. Not the guy. Who's always the guy. Still, the you are not the guy. You fit the description. Still, you fit because the description. there is only one Still, guy. You are not the guy. Still, you fit the description because there is only one guy who is always the guy that fits the description. Still, you are not the guy. Still, you fit the description because there is only one guy who is always the guy fitting the description. America turned loose on America. In memory of Trayvon Martin. In memory of Jordan Russell Davis. In memory of Oscar Grant. In memory of Eric Garner. In memory of John Crawford. In memory of Michael Brown. In memory of Walter Scott. In memory of Freddie Gray. In memory of Tamir Rice. In memory of the Mother Emanuel Church Nine. In memory of Sandra Bland. In memory of Jamar Clark. In memory, Alton Sterling. In memory, Terence Crutcher. In memory of Philando Castile. In memory, Jordan Edwards. In memory, Stefan Clark. In memory, Ahmad Aubrey. In memory, Brianna Taylor. In memory, George Floyd. In memory. In memory. In memory. In memory. In memory. Because white men can't police their imagination. Black men are dying. Some years. There exists a wanting to escape. You. You are not anyone. Not anyone. Worthless. Not worth you. Your own weight insists you are here. I. They. He. She. We. You. Who is this you? Hey, you. You are everywhere and nowhere. The outside comes in. You. Hey, you. Who do you think you are saying I to me? You nothing. You nobody. You. You are injured. Not sick. Not crazy. Not angry. Not sad. I. They. He. She. We. You. You. The worst injury is feeling you don't belong so much to you. Your own sigh, it's no longer audible. You've grown into it. Some call it aging, an internalized liquid smoke blurring, ordinary ache. Just this morning. What did he say? Come on. Get back in the car. What did he say? 
your partner wants to face off with a mouth and who knows what handheld objects the other vehicle carries, you pull your love back in the seat because you know though no one seems to be chasing you. The justice system has other plans. Yes. And this is how you are a citizen. Come on. Come on. Let it go. Let it go. Move on. Move on. Move on. Despite the air conditioning, you pull the button back and the window slides down into its door sleeve. A breeze touches your cheek. As something should. What feels more than feeling? You are afraid there is something you are missing, something obvious. Do feelings lose their feeling if they speak to a lack of feeling? Don't feel like you are mistaken. It's not that. Is it not that? You are oversensitive or misunderstanding. Oh, don't be ridiculous. None of your other black friends feel this way. And how you feel is how you feel. Even if what you perceive isn't tied to what is. What, what is? is? And so it goes. You smile dumbly at the world because you are still feeling. If only the feeling could be known. Every day your mouth opens and you receive the kiss the world offers, which seals you shut, though you are feeling sick to your stomach about the beginning of the feeling that was born from understanding and now stumbles around in you. The go along to get along tongue, pushing your tongue aside. Yes and your mouth is full up and the feeling is still tottering. And of course you want the days to add up to something more than you came in out of the sun and drank the water of your developed world. Yes, and because words hang in the air like pollen, the throat closes. You hack away. That time. And that time. And that time. To arrive like this every day. For it to be like this, to have so many memories and no other memory than these for as long as they can be remembered, to remember this. To a share of all remembering. A measure of all memory is breath. Breath. And to breathe. You have to create a truce, a truce with the patience of a stethoscope. I can hear his even breathing that creates passages to dreams. And yes, I want to interrupt to tell him. Her. Us. You. Me. I don't know how to end what doesn't have an ending. Tell me a story. Yesterday at the tennis court, I was waiting in the car for time to pass. A woman pulled in and started to park her car facing mine. Our eyes met, and what passed, passed as quickly as the look away. She backed up and parked on the other side of the lot. I could have followed her to worry my question, but I had to go. I was expected on the court. I grabbed my racket. Did you win? It wasn't a match. It was a lesson. <laughs>